With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, it has become tougher to attend majalis at centers. This Muharram, millions of people will not get the chance to go to their local Husseiniyya or Imam Bagha. Flying to Karbala has become really difficult. This would mean that we all solely rely on TV stations such as ours to participate and recount the tragedies that befell upon Imam Hussain alayhi salam and his 72 companions. Our duty during the holy months of Muharram and Safa is to bring to you 40 days of exclusive feeds depicting the story of Karbala through live lectures, eulogies and images from the holy land of Karbala and not forgetting our 24-7 live broadcast of the world's biggest gathering on earth, the Arba'in Walk, the holy footsteps of Bibi Zainab and Bibi Raqqaya and the family of the Prophet will be shown all over the world. This is made possible by the sincere hard work and dedication of our media teams in London and Karbala, who braved the early hours of the morning to film, edit, broadcast fresh content for you every single day. Many other departments work tirelessly day in and day out to keep the five channels running smoothly for our dear viewers, especially those in the financial department raising funds to allow the channel to keep on streaming the beauty of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes for free. And so we are turning to you for your support that you would normally provide to your local Hussainiyat to raise funds in the name of the Master of the Martyrs Imam Hussain alayhi salam and his 72 companions. Imam Hussain Media Group are looking to raise £72,000 per channel in order to help and finance the broadcasting of its five channels during Muharram and the Arba'in season. This is a combined effort between all five channels to raise a total of £360,000. Make sure the name of Imam Hussain alayhi salam shall continue to echo throughout the ages of time. Help spread the message of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Be a part of the movement and be a part of the legacy of Imam Hussain alayhi salam today. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتني لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد O oh Arabs you are miserable because I have appointed Osama as a general over you and you have raised questions concerning his qualifications to lead you in war God knows that the same ones of you <clears throat> had raised the same questions about his father. By Allah, Osama is qualified to be a general over you. 
Like his father, Zayd was qualified to be a general. Now obey him and go towards him. Usama bin Zayd was in his late teens, 17, 18, 19, 20 years of age. When he was asked by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, to lead the final expedition of the religion of Islam in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Indeed, you find that this final expedition was an expedition that was heading towards Rome or heading towards Asia Minor, as some would put it. And you find that when a person at that age was given this leadership, there are many who were around at the time who were much older than him, much more prominent than him. Some who had converted to the religion of Islam much earlier than him. Amongst them, the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, Sa'id bin Zayd, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. All of these had converted or had come towards the religion of Islam many years before Osama. But now, here they saw that Osama was the one who was going to lead them in battle. This caused one of the most controversial incidents in the history of the religion of Islam. One would assume that a few days before the Holy Prophet passes away, he would pass away in peace. You'd think that the Holy Prophet in his last moments would bid farewell to everybody. Everyone would bid farewell to him. He'd leave this world without there being any quarrels, any dissensions, any problems. Yet you find as we examined yesterday, when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, asks for a pen and paper, they tell him the Quran is sufficient for us. And now on this occasion, when he asks everybody in the whole of Medina to join Osama, suddenly there are a few who begin to say, why should we join the army of Osama? Why should we be under the authority of Osama? These few are not any personalities in Islamic history. These are amongst the most famous, the ones who over millions, hundreds of millions of people until today admire and revere. But all of a sudden, in the final few days of the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, everything that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, begins to mention is suddenly questioned. His authority is suddenly under threat. All of a sudden, if he wants to give guidance on an issue, appoint a commander on an issue, all of a sudden people are raising objections. And these personalities who are raising objections are personality who without a doubt are revered by all schools. You find all schools of non-Shia have a reverence for Abu Bakr as the first Khalifa, have a reverence for Umar as the second Khalifa. They look at them with the highest level of respect. Yet without a doubt there are many who have not examined this issue. And even those who examine this issue find themselves in a pickle because hold on, if Abu Bakr and Umar are ordered by the Prophet to join the army of Osama, then what are they doing in Medina in the final moments of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? If now the Holy Prophet has ordered you to leave with that army, then what are you doing leading prayer in the final moments of the life of the Holy Prophet in Medina when you're meant to be in the army? If you say you're leading prayer, then you look like the greatest companion of the Prophet. But if you admit you're leading prayer, that means you haven't joined Osama's army. And those who haven't joined Osama's army, that means that they've gone against the wishes of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Other questions also arise. Why, O oh Prophet of God, would you ask all of your companions to suddenly leave Medina except Ali ibn Abi Talib? Every companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, from the Muhajirun, was asked to leave Medina. Why? You're in your final moments. The illness has overcome you. You're on your deathbed. A month earlier, Abdullah bin Mas'ud and others say, we knew that the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family was going to pass away. Imagine all of a sudden, someone looks at all of you, close to him, and says to you, all of you leave London. I want all of you to go and stay in Northampton. You're like, to us, hold on a minute. You're in your final moments. You want us to all leave? All of you leave. I only want Ali to stay. The rest of you have to leave. Question has to arise, Ya Rasulullah, why would you ask all of them to leave Medina? For what reason? 
Surely you could say to Osama bin Zaid, Osama, take with you 700, take with you 1,000, take with you 1,200, because normally the army that's spoken of of Osama, that's headed towards Jorf or Jarfa area, normally is spoken of a 700 or 1,000 or 1,200. Why all of a sudden, Ya Rasulullah, do you suddenly say that Abu Bakr has to join? Omar has to go. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas has to go. Abu Ubaidah Jarrah has to go. Sa'id bin Zaid has to go. Why do I mention these five? Because these five are in the list of those who are promised paradise. We know that you always hear that there are ten who are promised paradise. Amongst these ten are five who the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family wants out of Medina. Ya Rasulullah, you're dying. You would think you'd want your father-in-law to still be around. And your other father-in-law as well to still be around. At the end of the day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is married to Hafsa, daughter of Umar. And he's married to Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr. Would you tell your in-laws, get out of London in my final moments? Why would the Holy Prophet insist that everybody leaves Medina in those moments? Further than that, was there really a threat from the Romans at that time? As in, were the Romans really on the edge of Medina? Was it a case that the Romans really wanted to invade? Why would you all of a sudden, O Prophet of God, say everybody must join Osama? Further than that, O Prophet of God, why an 18-year-old or a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old? At the end of the day, what experience does he have on the battlefield? You could say that there are other companions at the time. For example, like Khalid ibn al-Walid. Khalid ibn al-Walid was around at the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. He had a lot of experience on the battlefield. You could say that Umar ibn al-Khattab had experience on the battlefield. You could say that there were other companions of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, who had experience on the battlefield. Ya Rasulullah, why would you ask an 18-year-old to lead your final army? You could ask those who are in their 50s, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Bakr, how, were, how old were they at the time? They were nearly the age of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. At least in Abu Bakr's case, he was way older than Osama. Therefore, all of these questions arise. That's why is it that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, insisted that all the companions get out of Medina except Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Tonight, I'd like to examine the expedition of Osama, or Jaish Osama, in order for us to be able to understand what took place in the final moments of the life of our Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, and what repercussions emerge from it. And I'd like to do it in the following stages. Number one, why Osama bin Zayd to lead an army? What had happened to his father Zayd a few years earlier that meant that Osama should lead this army? Number two, and of the utmost importance, how many days before the Prophet died, had he made it clear that Osama should lead? Number three, did Osama have any pedigree in war? And if he did, which famous battle did many run away from? But he stuck with Imam Amir al muminin on that day. Of the utmost importance next in the questions, when we look at the final moments, how did the Prophet realize that there are people who are beginning to object why were they objecting? What reasons were they giving to objecting? Five, what did the Holy Prophet say when he heard that there are people objecting? And what did he mean when he said, O oh Arabs, you are miserable because I've appointed Osama as a general over you, like you were with his father. What did he mean with this statement? Further than that, if Imam Ali is the greatest soldier, why send all of them to war and keep Ali in Medina? What was the Prophet trying to insist and on what point? After that, if Abu Bakr led the final prayer, what was Abu Bakr doing in Medina? And if he was there in Medina, then what does it say about his obedience to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family? Finally, what did Omar say when people said that the Prophet had passed away? How did he go around telling others that they should never say such words? And how did the Prophet become sad by the behaviors of those around him and the way that they disrespected him in his final moments before he died? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. We are talking about Osama leading an army in the 11th year after Hijrah. The question arises, why lead this army and why Osama? 
A few years earlier, in a land known as Mu'tah, Osama's father, Zayd, the son of Haritha, was with Ja'far al-Tayyar and Abdullah ibn Rawaha, leading the Muslims against the Romans, against the Christians of Rome and the Christians of Arabia. Osama's father, Zayd, as we all know, was the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Uh, Zayd bin Haritha was known as one what? A mawla of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And you found that this Zayd bin Haritha was beloved to the Holy Prophet. Even the Holy Prophet would say about Osama, I love him, the one who I love and the son of who I love. Because not only did he love Osama, but he loved his father Zayd as well. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, had sent one of his ambassadors to the Roman Christians, they killed the ambassador of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. When they killed the ambassador of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, the Holy Prophet decided that an army had to march towards Mu'tah. Where's Mu'tah? Mu'tah is in Jordan today. You see, unfortunately, Ja'far al-Tayyar is one of the ghuraba in our world because he is buried in Jordan. And I don't think many of us necessarily go to Jordan on holiday. And nor are many of us going to necessarily go to Mu'tah and sit there relaxed. Because there are still certain countries in the world where you still have a bit of a hatred towards the Shia in one way or the other because of different angles, different directions, different motives that may exist. But you found that when they went towards the Romans, they were led by Ja'far al-Tayyar, by Zayd, Osama's father, and by Abdullah bin Rawaha. They went as a few thousand. But what happened was that the Romans and their Christian counterparts in Arabia had joined forces with one another. When they joined forces with one another, that became a number of 200,000. The Muslims had a good number, as in there were some known soldiers in that army. Ja'far al-Tayyar is not someone easy to get past. Zayd bin Haritha, Abdullah bin Rawaha, others who were there, Khalid bin al-Walid was in that army as well. When they went towards the Romans, they realized that the Romans would outnumber them. The Romans were a greater number than the Muslims. So the Muslims said, maybe we should write to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and tell him that we are outnumbered. Abdullah bin Rawaha turned around and said, no, we seek martyrdom and we have nothing to be scared of. What's the issue? Let's go towards them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be there to help us. Anyone who doubts, on the day of Badr, we were a small number and we overcame a mighty force. But on this occasion, they were too small. Badr was 313 versus 950. Whereas on this occasion, what do you have? 3,000 against 200,000. There was no way that they were going to come out victorious. But what they came out with was dignity. Because what you found was that Zayd bin Haritha fought until he was killed. Ja'far al-Tayyar fought until he lost both his arms. As Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam in his famous line says, Rahimallah ammi al-Abbas. Laqad athara wa fada wa wasa akhahu bi nafsih. Hatta a'taha Allah janahayn. Iwada yadayh. Kama sana'a. To who? Ja'far bin Abi Talib. We see in this narration that Imam Zayn al-Abideen says, Allah has placed his mercy on my uncle Abbas, who altruistically gave himself away for his brother and lost his arms in the same way that his uncle Ja'far al-Tayyar lost his arms as well. Ja'far al-Tayyar lost his arms in that battle. Hence, when we say Tayyar, because he lost his arms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces them with wings in Jannah. Not literally wings. As in, I don't expect to see Ja'far al-Tayyar flying around Jannah while we're walking. No. Rather, the majesty that comes with the angels, there's a certain majesty that comes with somebody like Ja'far al-Tayyar alayhi salam. Zayd killed, Ja'far killed. And of course, when Ja'far was killed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, while the battle was taking place, he was narrating what's happening. Imagine, the Prophet is in Medina, they are fighting in Jordan, and the Prophet is telling everybody this is what's taking place. Because he has knowledge of the unseen, of what Allah gives him. Ilm al-Ghayb can be given in portions to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, until when Ja'far, when the Prophet heard that Ja'far died, it broke the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. To the extent, you know, when someone dies in our community, we have a fatha for them. 
We go to the Hsenia. It's a, it's a reason that you go to send your condolences. In some cases for men, it's a reason to take a break from the missus at home as well. But you have a Fatha, and you go to the Fatha, and when you go to that Fatha, one thing you also want is good food and then Fatha. Who do you think cooked the food when Ja'far al-Tayyar died for their family? Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam She helped Asma bint Umais, Ja'far's wife. They had the young Abdullah as one of their sons. She helped, she cooked food three days in a row. Because sometimes in Iraq, people say, these fawatiha, too many, three days, just do one day. Ja'far al-Tayyar died three days for him. And food was being served. And people were coming, honoring Ja'far. But there wasn't necessarily as many people honoring Zayd or honoring Abdullah bin Rawaha. But those three in that army gave their lives away. There are others, I can name another nine, ten, who gave their lives away. And the Muslims, instead of continuing to fight, Khalid ibn Walid decided, let's go back. He took the army back with him. And you know when the army went back, they entered Medina and the people of Medina were like, you're the ones who f uh, flew away and ran away while those guys were martyred? Well, if you're going to be the sword of Allah, there has to be a reason that you're the sword. I'm not understanding. As in, I see Ja'far martyred. I see Zayd martyred. I see Abdullah bin Rawaha martyred. And I see you coming back. And then again, if you're the ones who control the media, then you can make this one become the truthful. And that one separates the good and bad. And that one is the sword. And that one is Khal al Mu'mineen. And Abd al Shaytan ibn Muljim becomes Abd of Rahman. And so on and so forth. You begin to see that they came back, and when they came back into the area, people turned around, and what did the people say? The two people came back while those people lost their lives. The Holy Prophet tried to calm everyone down, and the Holy Prophet had made it clear that, look, what they did to us is a lesson for us as well. And in the future, they will not come onto our territory in that way. And truly, they never came back on the territory in that way. The question arises then, that why Osama the one to lead? Because his father... Zayd bin Haritha got killed by these people. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi placed Osama to be the leader. First question. What's the first question that we need to ask here? Osama bin Zayd has any pedigree in war? As in, ya Rasulullah, as in, okay, I can understand that his dad got killed. But you need someone experienced on the battlefield. You can't have someone on the battlefield who's not that experienced. Oh, Osama had experience and his tutor was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And if your tutor is Ali ibn Abi Talib, then that's enough experience for you on the battlefield. What was his experience on the battlefield? At Hunayn, when the Quran said, Walaytum. Al Iraqi, when he sees someone he wants to get rid of, he says, Khali Walli, yes, get out of my face, yes, move from me. Walaytum, yes, and this was a group of you, yes, Walaytum, you all ran away. And the Battle of Hunayn, when the oppositions of the Arabs marched on the Muslims, how many of them ran away? On this day, I don't see any Khalid bin Walid again, even though he was in that battle. Saif Allah al Mas'ah. Where? Where? As in, all I see is Ali ibn Abi Talib with Fadl ibn al Abbas, with al Abbas, with a few others, and with a 15 year old Osama. Osama remained with Imam Ali on that day. Why does Imam Zain al Abidin always say, I am the son of the one who fought at Badr and at Uqud and Hunayn? Why in Dua Nudba do we read, Ahqad Badriya wa Hunayniya? Because these victories of Imam Ali, they cause envy. You know, when you see someone who's good at something, the pure hearted has ghibta. He says, MashaAllah, he's so good at what he does. But the one with a filthy heart has hasad. Al Mu'min yaghbitu wa la yahsid. Al Mu'min has good envy, not bad envy. These people saw Imam Ali at that day, but who was with Imam Ali? Who were the ones who remained loyal while the others ran away? One of them was Osama. He remained loyal. He was only 15 years of age, but you could be a 15 year old. And on your CV, you've never ran away from war. And you could be at 60, and every battle you ran away from. 15 years old, and he never once ran away from the battlefield. He was there with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Therefore, if someone asks why the Holy Prophet would put this 18 year old to lead, we reply by saying when he was 15, the rest of you ran away, he remained firm. If I now see, if you remember all of us when we were at school, you may find someone, he's not the strongest guy in the world, but he's always standing there till the end. And then you see someone else, biceps, triceps, six pack. The moment there's a battle, he's run. 
There's the one who doesn't have all of that, but he's a firm contender in that battle. I see Osama bin Zaid, when I see him, I see Osama as somebody who's firmly in control of what he's doing. And so the first reason is that the Holy Prophet looked at him at Hunayn and he said, this person can lead. But I ask a second question. Who died at Mu'tah? It wasn't just Osama's father. It was Ali's brother as well. Why not let Ali lead the vengeance? Osama's father died at Mu'tah. Ja'far al-Tayyar is Imam Ali's brother. So if the reason is because you lost someone from you, so why not give the raya to Imam Ali alayhi salam? And why not say to Ali, you go towards the Romans. Why? Because I want Ali to stay in Medina and I want to get rid of all of those who will stand in the way of Ali. See, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam insist on this battle? For what reason? The Romans were entering Medina? Nothing. There was not even a preemptive. There was nothing where you had a spy who was suddenly caught and what are you doing over here? Nothing at all. Why, O Prophet of God, a week before you die, you ask the whole of London to leave London? Why? Have you ever witnessed anything like this? All of you, Muhajirun, get out of Medina. All of you, go with Osama. What? But why get out? Why? No, 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 get out. All of you, get out. All of you leave. Only the son of Abu Talib stays and members of Bani Hashim. Every one of you get out. Ya Rasulullah, you're in your final moments. Surely you want to make sure that everything goes smooth as you're passing away. Abu Bakr, leave. Omar, Leave. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, leave. Abu Ubaida, Nijar, leave. Sa'id bin Zayd, leave. Because tomorrow when I enter Saqifa, these five names are the main names on that day. But notice, Saqifa, before it happens, before that whole election happens where you place who you want to come into power, a few days earlier, do you think the Prophet doesn't know what's about to happen? So what does the Prophet do in front of everybody, everyone? Anfidhu, ba'tha Osama. All of you go towards Osama now. All of you. You go with him. What was the first thing that came up? But Ya Rasulullah, you're ill. And we're worried about you. No, 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 get out. Go. I don't need anyone worried about me. Doesn't interest me one bit. I'm telling you as your prophet, if you believe in me as a prophet of God, and you believe what the Quran says, whatever the prophet gives you, take it. And whatever he tells you not to do, don't do it, correct? And what else does the Quran say? He doesn't speak of his own will. He speaks of revelations from his Lord. What else does the Quran say? قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ الله. Say if you claim to love Allah, follow me. Allah will love you. That's on the one side. A series of verses where we are ordered. Whatever he tells you, you do. Whatever he says, no, you don't do. Correct? We are told he receives revelations. He doesn't speak of his own will. We are told that if you claim to love Allah, you follow him. Allah will love you. You don't follow him. On the other hand, what are we told? Hurting him brings la'na from Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Do we agree? Well, someone might turn around to me and say, Sayyidina, احنا, you know, within Shiaism, this la'na that we have, la'na on Shimr, la'na on Umar bin Sa'ad, la'na on Ibn Ziyad, this is not uh, Shiaism, because this is not love. Habibi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, 114 surahs, 113, he started with love, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. One of them, he said, no love. Bara'ah. Why, ya Allah, don't you start every surah, love, 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 love? No, there's one surah, no way. Why? This Quraysh who have heard my prophet, no way will I show love to them. No way. Bara'atun min Allah wa rasulah illa ladina ahattun min al-mushrikeen. Why bara'ah min al-mushrik? Because he hurt Rasulullah. Therefore, that means anyone who hurts Rasulullah, there has to be bara'a from us towards them. 
أني أتقرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإلى الحسين بموالاتكم وبالبراءة من I get closer to them through holding on to them and dissociating from their enemies the Quran said إن الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا those who hurt Allah and his prophet if now I your prophet say to you bring me a pen and paper and you turn around and say Quran's enough for us when you say Quran's enough for us that means those Muslims now in the 21st century who say we don't need hadith Quran's enough you've given them all the ammunition in the world Secondly, how's the Quran enough for us? Is Zaydiya have their opinion on the Quran? Ismailiya have their opinion on the Quran? Salafiya have their opinion on the Quran? Sunni has his opinion? Sufi has it? How was the Quran enough? The Quran without a guardian can never be enough. There has to be a hujjah alongside the Quran. But when your Prophet tells you something and you turn around to him and say, No, no, the Quran's enough for us. When you fight in front of him, does this not hurt him? When you cause a quarrel, it doesn't hurt him. When he tells you to do something and you blatantly don't do it, oh, what do you begin to do? You begin to be very slow in replying back to him. Because you know the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, the Monday, before the Monday that he died, he made it clear. Everybody in Medina has to join Osama's army. Only Ali bin Abi Talib stays behind. Everybody else has to go under Osama's army. First thing is, but Ya Rasulullah, you know what? Um, he's 18. So what? If Rasulullah told me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to follow an 11 year old, I would follow. If he told me to follow a 5 year old, I would follow. Because an Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has a greater right of the believer than they have over themselves. And the Quran says, Ati'u Allah wa Ati'u Rasul. I cannot pick and choose. Because sometimes that's the problem we have as Muslims. We pick and choose of Islam. What suits us and Muharram suits us. What suits us outside of Muharram. The Holy Prophet, I have to follow him in every order. He tells me, 18 year old, I say, finished. Taslim, ta'a, I follow you in whatever you say. I cannot question. He was highlighting that number one, Islam is not ageist. Don't come a few days later in Ghadir and say the man's too young. A few days later when the Prophet dies and say, Ali is too young. I put an 18 year old to be over you. Number two, I don't care if you're 55 or 65 or 75. Sometimes I see that there's more ikhlas in the 18 year old than there is in the 60 year old. Because at the end of the day, what's the point? If I'm aged, but I have no sincerity or the dots of hypocrisy affect me. I would rather have someone pure leading. Thirdly, he was highlighting that this person, Osama, those names who are around him from the Muhajirun, he leads them. They don't lead him. It's huge because there are some big names there. And those big names were people who had joined Islam before Medina. And they began to ask questions. What? We, the ones who were the foremost in faith, we now are under the authority of an 18 year old? If you believe that man receives wahi from the heavens, you would never open your mouth. Unless you don't believe in the Jibra'il that comes to him. And rather you believe, لعبت هاشم بالملك فلا خبر جاء ولا وحي نزل. Unless you believe that there was no wahi, there was no revelation whatsoever. Because if my prophet has said to you, that's the leader. Because everyone tells me that nobody was as great as Abu Bakr alongside Rasulullah. An 18 year old leads him. So how do I follow him? If an 18 year old led Imam Ali, I'd have to ask questions. Because I'll be like, hold on a minute. Imam Ali is being led by an 18. Nah, there's no chance in hell that Osama bin Zayd can lead Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's impossible. But others, well then you're in the world of fallibles again. And when you're in the world outside of Ashab al-Kisa, it's open game. Now you're in the world of fallibles. Why should you be more than him? For what reason? You're not ma'soom, he's not ma'soom. What makes you better? What makes you better? You're both not ma'soom. Innama Yuridu highlighted that there were five in Medina who were on a different level to everyone else. Otherwise, you're both not ma'soom. If Abu Bakr is the greatest alongside the Prophet, surely why would the Prophet put him under the command of an 18-year-old? 
Another excuse they were pulling was what? How could we be led by someone who's the son of an ex-slave? Hamiyat al jahili as well. You know, that at the end of the day, we are being led by the son of Zayd, who was like the adopted son of Rasulullah. It's like, what's going on here? This is not the order of aristocracy that we were accepting. When the Prophet saw this, even though he's not feeling well, he said to Imam Ali, he said to Al-Fadl, take me, get me up. I want to talk to all of them now. O oh, Arabs, this is his speech. O oh, Arabs, you are miserable because I've appointed Osama as a general over you. And you've begun to raise questions about his qualifications to lead you in war. You are the same people who raised questions about his father's ability to lead in war. Then he said to them, by Allah, Osama is qualified to be a general over you. And his father is qualified to be a general over you. Now go and obey his orders. Yesterday, what did the Prophet say? Qumu'anni. True? Get out. Now again, get out. Get out of Medina. وَمَنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ وَمَنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُ عَلَى النِّفَاقِ The amount of... You know what Medina was at that stage? Oh my God, Isana. Even I have to hold back in terms of how I say some things because our own Shia get worried. I forget the non-Shia. Non-Shia in some cases will say, listen, that's your narrative. Well, the Shia starts getting worried when a Shia becomes high on the Shia monitor. Even I have to get worried because you know what Medina was at the time? One side of Medina, Munafiq Central. You know, Munafiq Central. But we can't mention the names of who. Only Allah knows who. We have no aql. There's no aql here. At the end of the day, if a person tells him, mm, you're delirious, no, but you can't. There's no aql. Munafiqs everywhere in Medina. What else did we have in Medina? We had ex con central. Ex cons. All the ex cons. 700 ex cons. What do I mean by ex cons? All the ones who joined Islam because of their love of Islam. Of course, Abu Sufyan joined Islam because he, he, he loves Islam. And Muawiyah couldn't wait to be a Muslim. And the rest of the group that was there, the rest of them were all similar. Oh, imagine what Medina was at the time. What's the best thing the Prophet could do? Complete car wash. Everybody out. Out. Get everybody out of Medina. Get everyone out. They were now suddenly moving one way and the other. Some of them went with Osama. They went six kilometers away from Medina. And then there were some of them who were sitting and waiting. Do we go? Don't we? Remember, Ghadir had only been a couple months earlier. They know there's a problem. And they know the man's dying. And so what begins to happen? And I will show you. Because Ibn Taymiyyah jumps at rejecting this. Because it's a major riddle for him. Ibn Taymiyyah, when he looks, no, 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 no. Anyone who talks about this stuff is a kadhab liar. Huh. Ibn Hajar is a liar. And then Suyut is a liar. Qastalani is a liar. Ibn al Jawzi is a liar. Tahawi is a liar. Safa is a liar. All of these are liars. Each one of them makes it clear that the Prophet ordered Abu Bakr, Omar, Abu Ubaida, Sa'id bin Zayd. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, all of you have to leave. Get out of Medina. You're not allowed to stay. Some of them left. Some of them, every time they'd be asked, they'd be hanging around, go, come back. What's happening? Is he alive? Is he dead? Subhanallah. The concern is, is he dead? Is he alive? What's happening with the authority thing? What goes on with it? If he dies, how, how do we assume... Get out of Medina. Get out. Again, he would keep repeating, leave Medina. Leave Medina. Were they leaving Medina? They wouldn't leave. There were some who were with Osama. Suhaib, the Roman, receives news from a lady that the prophets in his final moments. Some of these companions, what do they do? They leave Osama. They come back. The prophet finds out that they've come back into town. Get out. Ya Rasulullah, you're the one who came to instill akhlaq. 
You're telling people to get out? Why? Because I know what they want to do. And if you don't believe said Ammar saying it, go and look at the books of history at three days later, the name of the two personalities who were the first to go and organize an election. Back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And until it reached the stage, if you've been ordered by the Prophet to leave, how are you leading prayer? Because the most famous line given as to why Abu Bakr should be the first Khalifa is because he led the final prayer. Firstly, in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, many led prayer. So does every one of them have to become Khalifa? But secondly, what are you doing there? What are you doing there? How comes you're in Medina? You've been commanded to leave. What's the excuse you'll find by polemicists on YouTube everywhere? That you know what happened was because they felt really bad for the Prophet. The Prophet didn't say to anyone, feel bad for me. He said, get out. Until he says to me, come back, I can't come back. Unless I can object to his command and blatantly come back. And while he's gone to lead the prayer, his daughter Aisha has pushed him to lead the prayer. Bukhari mentions this. He says that he came and he does the takbir until the Prophet comes out and removes and he begins to lead the prayer. Rasulullah is unwell. He's not feeling well. In his final moments, you're not leading prayer. He removes him from the leading of prayer. All of you should be where? You should be with Osama's army. Why all of a sudden are all of you back? Why these particular personalities are all back? They all came back. They came back to lead. This one came back to lead the final prayer. The others came back. They started surrounding the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And you found Osama over there not knowing what to do. What do I do? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, has told me to be the one who goes off towards the Romans. I don't know what's going on now. One moment people are telling me he's dying. Another moment he's telling me he's ill. But one thing that was clear, Abu Bakr and Umar did not accept to be under his authority. Because people ask the question that after Rasulullah died, what happened to Osama? Yes, after he died, they say that Abu Bakr said, Osama, your army can now go. Of course, now that you've assumed power, now that you become Khalifa, he said, now your army can go, Osama. Osama, and, but he said, I want one thing from you, Osama. I said, what is it? He said, I request that Omar stays behind. He wanted Omar to stay behind. Otherwise, the rest of the army was to go. Osama, therefore, did he leave? He left after the Prophet died. Was he meant to leave after or before? He was meant to have left before the Prophet died. He was meant to have gone before the Prophet died. But because they got in the way, and because so many of them were hanging around Medina, claiming that we care about the illness of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, when the reality was that, no, we want to make sure that the man, if he is to die, then we are present to oversee and witness everything that's taken place. A couple of questions emerge. First one which emerges is what? The first one that emerges in relation to this moment was what was the reaction of the people when the Prophet died? Because now this man, the, the Holy Prophet, in his last few days, what's he seen? He's seen, asked for a pen and paper, he's been told he's delirious and the Quran sufficient for us. And then further than that, he's seen his own companions who he said to them, go and join Osama's army. He's seen that instead of joining, they've all come back. He had made it clear that only Ali can stay. But rather these had all come back. When the Prophet died, what happened? What do you think the reaction is? If I hear someone's died in the community, what do I say? If we can recite Al-Fatiha for the person, yes, okay, no problem. Bismillah ar-Rahman. Oh, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Oh, no, Allah ajra. We have different lines. Have you ever heard anyone say, whoever says he's dead, I'll behead him? I know people love their dads. And if your dad passes away and someone says to you, listen, dad passed away, you're like, you know, I'm sorry, yeah, it's true, Ron. Wallah, I miss my father. Has anyone ever told you that if you say that he's died, again, I'll behead you? That no one, yeah, it's impossible. Omar ibn al-Khattab did. They said because he was grief-stricken. I don't know which human when they're grief-stricken says, I'll behead you if you ever say that again. Normally you'll say, listen, Habib, I beg you don't talk about it. Anymore. No, no, no. 
anyone who says the prophet has died, I'll behead them. Rather, he's gone back to his Lord like Moses. You know, the prophet's gone, Reba, or I'm not understanding. What's happening here? But what's this idea that I'll behead anyone who claims that the prophets died? What's all that about? I thought this is a religion of peace. One comedian in America said Islam is a religion of peace. A peace here, peace there, peace everywhere. And it started where? Here. He says, whoever claims the prophet has died, I'll behead. And then what did Abu Bakr say? وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ أَفَأَنْ مَاتَ وَقُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ Okay, but I'm not understanding. You're quoting the Quran, but when the Prophet asked you to stay with that army, you seemingly are not following all those verses. But now, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ But okay, at least this one's quoting an ayah. The other one says, whoever says he's dead, I'll behead them. He's not dead. He's gone back to his Lord like Moses, and he's going to come back again. In a certain period of time, I ask you, what is this that's happened to Islam at the end? You compare this with the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen salam at the end, and you compare with these, you see the directions that Islam went in. Second point, what Abu Bakr and Umar set as a precedent was, that if Muhammad says something, and we clearly objected to it, so if anyone from Muhammad's family says something, feel free to object. The precedent was set. I order you to go to Osama's army. You all reply by saying what? But he's 18. But, 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 but I'm the one who's come with revelation. Therefore, the man who's from me, when the Prophet says, Hussein is from me and I'm from Hussein. At the end of the day, Yazid can easily turn around and say one thing. If Abu Bakr can object to Muhammad, I can object to the grandson. Why can I not object? If they were able to object to the Prophet putting an 18-year-old and the Prophet blatantly, and that's why in Milal and Nahal of Shahristani, it says, La'na on those who turn away from the army of Osama. Yes. Now, I don't really care, even if that hadith is not there, even if it doesn't say, La'na on those who turn away. You agree that mercy should be withdrawn from those who turn away from who the Prophet has asked you to join? Of course, the mercy should be withdrawn. But the reality was that Karbala, as I've always said, did not happen overnight. It happened because there were incidents where famous personalities got away with demeaning the Prophet. So who was Aba Abdullah at the end? True. Yazid turns around and you could say that in the same way those two who were the closest to him were able to object to what he said. Likewise, if I want to now object... Who's going to stop me from objecting? The principle of objection against revelation and against authority was set in these moments. Osama bin Zaid, what happened to him? Because on this day he was 18 and the question always arises that this Osama, what happened? This Osama ended up going to fight because when Abu Bakr comes into power, there's all these wars that take place. And we're coming in a couple of nights to the Shia that were killed in that period. But amongst those who were killed were people who were apostates, people who claimed they were prophets. Osama went and he supposedly got revenge for the man who killed his father. This Osama, they say, wasn't necessarily loyal to Imam Ali السلام, at the beginning. But by the end, he showed loyalty to Ahlul Bayt And how does he show this loyalty? Look at Ahlul Bayt when you compare them to others. What is the contrast between Ahlul Bayt and others? Ahlul Bayt, the door of compassion is always there from them. The door of forgiveness is always there from Ahlul Bayt. The door of sympathy. This Osama never showed loyalty to Amir al muminin knowing what Amir al muminins position was on that day when he was in debt 60,000 dirham. Who did he get the money from? Hussein bin Ali. He went to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he said to him, Aba Abdullah, I'm in debt, 60,000 dirham. Can you help me? Did Imam al Hussein say, But you weren't loyal to my father? You never helped my father? You never stood for my father? No, on the contrary. 60,000 dirham, there you go. And because of that, he asked for forgiveness from the Ahlul Bayt. And that's why Imam al Baqir says that Imam al Hassan is the one who shrouded Zayd when he died. And if Imam al Hassan is the one who shrouds you when you die, then this without a doubt is the greatest honor. But on the one hand, that is the greatest honor for Zaid. On the other hand, when the Prophet says, no man was hurt like I was. Was he only hurt by the Quraysh? Not just the Quraysh. On the contrary, yesterday and today, I showed you how clearly those closest to him 
gave him the biggest headache at the end of his life. Those closest to him raised their objections. Those closest to him were the ones who clearly stood in the way of whatever guidance he wanted for that ummah. And that's why you found that who could he hold on to in those final moments? He could only hold on to his beloved family in those final moments. And especially his daughter Fatima. Because for him, his daughter Fatima was everything to him. And so were her sons. And that's why when you look at those final moments, you see a father and the difficulty of bidding farewell to a daughter. Because he had seen, I asked for a pen and paper. They called me crazy. I said to them, leave Medina. They come and object saying, why an 18 year old? The only ones in my community and the only ones who surround me who don't object is this girl over here, Fatima, and is her husband and are her two sons. How difficult it was for him to bid farewell to those who were the most loyal to him, especially Fatima Zahra when she got closer to him and he embraced her and the people saw her. They saw her crying for a moment and then they saw her smiling and they said to her, Fatima, why do you smile? Why do you cry? She replied by saying, I cry because I know that now he's going to pass away. But I smile because I'll be the first to join my father. Yes, imagine I'll be the first to go back towards my father. She smiled at that moment. But for the Prophet, it was extremely difficult to bid farewell to his daughter. Fast forward 50 years and picture Abba Abdullah bidding farewell to Fatima al-Halila in Medina to Fatima al-Sughra. Those of you who have daughters, how difficult is it when you leave your house? And your daughters call out, Baba, Baba, come here. Or you see your daughters crying because they want you to be next to them. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, I ask you, how difficult was it for him when he had to leave Medina to head towards Karbala? With him were some daughters, Sukain, Ruqayya. Those daughters were with him. But one daughter remained behind in Medina, Fatima al Sughra. She looked towards the the holy eyes of Abba Abdullah. She said to him, Father, Father, hug me one final time. This line, hug me, we see throughout Karbala. How beautiful is the embrace of Abba Abdullah. That his daughter says to him, hug me, Father, hug me one final time. Father, tell me, tell me, when are you all going to return back to Medina? Father, tell me, my baby brother, will I see him again? When she finished from her father, who did she go to? She went to her uncle Abbas alayhi salam. Imagine the arms of Abel Fadl when they come around you. She held the arms of Abel Fadl. Little did she know, she'll never hold those arms ever again. Little did she know, they'll be a day when he'll call out she embraced Abel Fad. who did she go to next she went towards her elder brother Akbar Allah she embraced Akbar she touched the face of Akbar she looked into the eyes of Akbar then who did she go to she went towards her auntie Zainab <laughs> Take your heart to sham at this moment, each of you. She went to her auntie Zainab alayhi salam. She said, Auntie, let me see you again, I beg you. She looked towards Rabab. She looked towards Layla. She looked towards Ramla. She looked at them one final time. That daughter bid farewell to her father. You know what she would do? Every day, is there any news from dad? There's no news. Is there any news from my father? No. Has my uncle Abbas come? No. Has my Qasim come? No. Has Akbar come? No. You know who she would go to? Umm al -Banin. Umm al -Banin, do you have anything from any news? Umm al would say, I'm waiting for my four as well. 
Allah. Umm al-Banin herself would be waiting as well. Uh, who else would she go to? She'd go to Umm Salama. She'd say, Grandma, Grandma, do you remember what dust, the clay that my grandfather Rasul Allah gave you? Uh, has it turned red? Has anything happened? Her grandma Umm Salama would say, no, nothing's happened. Uh, she'd wait, she'd wait, she'd wait uh, until one day she heard Umm al-Banin saying that the caravan from Karbala has come back. Uh, Fatima al-Zaghra came out. Uh, Show me Abba Abdullah. Show me my father, I beg you. Uh, she called out. Show me my brothers. Uh, she called out. Show me my auntie. Uh, all of a sudden, who came towards her? Uh, Sayyidah Zainab came to her. She said, Salamun alaykum. Uh, Fatima al-Zaghra looked at her and said, Wa alaykum as -salam. But who are you? I ask you what happened to the face of Zainab for her niece not to recognize her. She said to her oh lady, who are you? Tell me, who are you? She said to her, Sughra, don't you recognize me? She said to her, no, I don't. Tell me who you are, please. I want to know. Do you know my father, Hussein? Do you know my uncle, Abbas? She said to her, Sughra, I am Zainab in front of you. Uh, Sughra fell on the ground when she heard that that was Zainab in front of her. What was she thinking? That bruise on your eye, that slap on your cheek, what are all those injuries, oh auntie? But then she knew, she looked towards Rabab, where's the six month old baby? She looked towards Layla. Where's Akbar? Tell me where's Akbar. She looked towards Ramla. Tell me where's Qasim. But above all else, why oh why don't any of you tell me where my father is? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Let's raise our hands, my dear brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al Asri wa Zaman. Allow all of us to perform the ziyarah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And provide us with the intercession of our beloved Holy Prophet, Ya Allah. Allow our lives to be a life in obedience to the commands of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. For the originators of this majlis, Ya Allah, bless them with the intercession of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha in honor of our marhumin. But before it, wherever you may be, the loudest of your salawat. Karbala, a glimpse of his shrine would suffice. A flag graced by his holy tomb feels just as nice. Imam Hussein TV have the privilege of exclusively obtaining special flags from the holy shrine of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. This flag can be delivered to your home and you can have the blessings of Karbala in your own residence. For more details, please contact the numbers shown below now.